we have the power to begin the world again. A situation similar to the present hath not happened since the days of Noah until now. The birthday of a new world is at hand. Thomas Paine, 1775. The new world that Thomas Paine heralded was America, a nation born of revolution. The war began with a single shot fired in a small New England village and ended eight years later on the other side of the world. It would be waged from the Great Lakes to the Caribbean Sea, from the West Indies to India. 40 million people on four continents would become embroiled in this colonial rebellion. And within the colonies, Americans would bitterly fight their first civil war. For nine generations, the settlers of this vast frontier had considered themselves loyal British Americans. But foremost, they were Virginians. They were New Yorkers. They were Pennsylvanians. <laughs> Residents of 13 separate colonies stretched along the fringe of an untamed continent. In a time when it took two months to cross the Atlantic, they enjoyed the freedom of being governed from 3,000 miles away. But Parliament reached across the ocean with a firmer hand, demanding new taxes, forbidding settlement of the western frontier, sending royal troops to enforce British will. Americans resisted, rebelled, and finally revolted. An old New England militia captain explained in simple terms what finally pushed farmers and merchants and woodsmen into defying the greatest power on earth. What we meant in going for those redcoats, he said, was this. We had always governed ourselves and we always meant to. They didn't mean we should. On the night of April 18, 1775, the question of who would rule America was about to resound in gunfire. From Boston, the commander of the British forces in America, General Thomas Gage, dispatched 800 redcoats to the town of Concord to snuff out this insurrection before it could begin. Having received intelligence that ammunition, artillery, and small arms have been collected for the avowed purpose of raising rebellion against His Majesty, you will march to Concord, where you will seize and destroy all military stores whatever. Before the order reached British soldiers, it was passed to American spies who set in motion an elaborate series of alarms to warn the countryside. Shortly after 10 p.m., two lanterns glowed briefly in the steeple of Boston's Old North Church, just long enough to signal patriots across the Charles River that the Redcoats would move that night by water. The official courier of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, a 40-year-old silversmith named Paul Revere, received urgent orders from Joseph Warren, the head of rebel intelligence. About 10 o'clock, Dr. Warren begged that I would immediately set off for Lexington. Two friends rode me across the Childs River. They landed me on the Childsland side, went on to the town, and there got a horse. The moon shone bright. Around midnight, Revere reached the small town of Lexington and shouted, the regulars are coming. 
Paul Revere didn't say the British are coming because the colonists regarded themselves as British. Uh, they were British citizens who lived in America, but they were certainly British citizens. So Revere and the other dispatch riders said the regulars are coming or the redcoats are coming. The town bell rang, and for as far as it could be heard, young man and old pulled on their boots and headed for the village green. In the chill night, 130 militiamen stood at the ready for an hour. But it seemed the alarm might be false. Captain John Parker had sent scouts to locate the Redcoats, but not one had returned. Parker released the men to wait for the next call of the drum. Up to 30 withdrew to nearby Buckman Tavern. There's always a sort of a loaded situation when you're sitting in a tavern all night. I'm not sure at Buckman Tavern they felt the night of April 18th that they were uh, going to have a, a major war on their hands. I think they were intent on showing the British that they were serious. Out on the road, the regulars were being driven hard, a mile every 16 minutes. Their officers feared daybreak and detection. Inside some of the houses they passed, men and women were wide awake, melting pewter dishes into musket balls. Inside Buckman Tavern, all was quiet. At about 4.30, a scout returned with news. The Redcoats were indeed coming. They were less than half a mile down the road. Three British companies, about a hundred men, reached a crossroad. A hot-blooded young lieutenant had to choose between taking his men toward Concord, where he had been told to go, or into Lexington, where he could see armed Americans waiting. With his superiors out of earshot, Lieutenant Jesse Adair made his fateful choice. At five o'clock on the morning of April 19th, he led his men toward Lexington Green. Captain Parker gathered his men, now fewer than 80, and gave his orders. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. No one knew what would happen when the two forces collided, and certainly no colonial uh, commander wanted to give the order to fire. If they fired on British regulars, they could be tried for treason. And the punishment for committing treason was the most hideous punishments. They were hanged, their arms were cut off, their legs were cut off, they were disemboweled. It was a very slow, painful death. So no one wanted to give that order. The militia heard British Major John Pitcairn yell, lay down your arms, and another officer shout, ye rebels disperse, damn you, disperse. Outnumbered, Captain Parker told his men to abandon the green. Then, from somewhere, a shot rang out. There is no saying who fired it, rebel or redcoat. But in that puff of smoke, the bond of kinship between England and America was severed. This is a revolutionary situation in which literally everything changes, not merely in the course of a single day, but almost in the course of a single minute. As long as it takes to fire the guns and the soldiers drop dead, everything has changed. In the chaos, the British charged forward, blindly thrusting their bayonets and ignoring their officers' shouts to fall in. At last, the drums brought the Redcoats back into ranks and their officers marched them the way they were supposed to have gone in the first place, toward Concord. The British took stock and found they had only one man wounded, a private shot in the thigh. 
For the families in Lexington, the toll was unthinkable. Eight men lay dead. Nine more were wounded. Among the survivors, shock gave way to rage. They shouldered their muskets and set off toward Concord to vent their grief in British blood. Paul Revere never finished his midnight ride. Just after 1 a.m., he was captured by a British patrol. But the alarm was carried to Concord by a local physician, Samuel Prescott, who had been recruited by Revere less than an hour earlier. As day broke on April 19th, virtually every town within 20 miles had been alerted that the Redcoats were coming. By 8 a.m., the British reached Concord to search for rebel arms. All they could find were three cannon, 60 casks of flour, and 500 pounds of musket balls. A mile and a half north of Concord, about 100 redcoats were holding a small bridge. On a hill above them, 400 angry militiamen gathered and waited. The Concord militia was being steadily reinforced by men from neighboring Acton, Bedford, Carlisle. Yet they made no move until they saw smoke billowing over the town. The British were burning the few armaments they had found but the militiamen assumed it was their homes. They advanced on the North Bridge. Minuteman Amos Barrett reported he was within 15 rods of the Redcoats, about 80 yards, when they opened fire. They fired three guns, one after the other. I see the ball striking the river on the right of me. Their balls whistled well. Militia Major John Buttrick shouted, fire, fellow soldiers, for God's sake, fire. In the exchange, two militiamen were killed. Four of eight British officers were wounded. Three enlisted men fell dead. And the King's troops fell back. Fleeing toward Concord, they rejoined the commander of their expedition, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith. Smith had been expecting a relief column, but it was hours overdue. He finally began what he called a strategic withdrawal back towards Boston. To the Americans, it looked like a retreat, and it looked like an opportunity. Using a shortcut, the militia reached a crossing called Merriam's Corner ahead of the King's troops. Taking cover behind houses, fences, and trees, they waited for their quarry to march into their trap. Before we'd gone half a mile, we were fired on from all sides. The country was full of woods, which the rebels did not fail to take advantage of. But they were all lined with people who kept an incessant fire upon us. Their numbers increasing from all parts, while ours was reduced by deaths, wounds, and fatigue. Lieutenant John Barker. The British thought that the Americans' tactics were pretty shameful. Uh, many British participants complained bitterly at the way in which the Americans had, from behind cover, shot at them on the road. They found this very difficult to cope with. They were not used to this guerrilla type of warfare. 
Exhausted and out of ammunition, the Redcoats finally saw their salvation. Lord Hugh Percy's relief column of a thousand men arrived. Smith's men took an hour's rest under the protection of Percy's cannon. Then they resumed their retreat. As many as 3,000 rebels now lined the road. The British faced a 15-mile gauntlet back to Boston, maintaining their formation under a withering fire. It became the great myth that the British were stupid standing there and getting shot at. They really didn't have any other choice. I mean, once they were on the road and they were out there, they had to get back in some kind of order. The minute they all spread to the four winds, they'd be in individual targets. A little bit harder to find, but you'd lose all of your military capacity if you did that. So that was the only tactical choice that they could make. At sundown, the Redcoats finally reached safety near Boston. More than 270 men, nearly one in six, were wounded, missing, or dead. It was really a rural riot is what it was. Everybody came and took a shot, you know, and uh, all day long this was escalating and escalating when the British finally got back practically destroyed. Uh, the country could never be the same again. The day after Lexington and Concord, Lord Percy wrote with a newfound respect for the rebel farmers. Whoever looks upon them as an irregular mob will find himself much mistaken. They have men among them who know very well what they are about. For my part, I never believed that they would have attacked the king's troops or have had the perseverance I found in them yesterday. All around Boston, just hours after the echoes of gunfire had faded, a ghost-like rebel army began to fill the night. The country into which I had just set my foot was set on fire about my ears. The fatal 19th of April, the moment the event of that day was known, I rejected the sullen-tempered Pharaoh of England forever, Thomas Paine. After the clash at Lexington on April 19th, express riders rushed from one New England village to another, shouting the news that the king's troops had spilled colonial blood. Within a day, 20,000 men responded. The militiamen are now simply ordinary farming people with their hats turned around, as you might say, and with a rifle or with a musket. How good soldiers are they? Well, they've drilled. Uh, they've had perhaps some, some uh, target practice. They are amateur soldiers. Their counterparts, the British Redcoats, once had been weavers or shoemakers or farmers themselves. But each had failed and found himself forced into the job of last resort, British soldier. A popular English saying warned, a messmate before a shipmate, a shipmate before a stranger, a stranger before a dog, and a dog before a soldier. The Redcoats, whether or not they were the dregs of British society, and many of them came from the very poorest of the poor, it's true, were full-time soldiers, taught how to kill and how to bayonet, and taught also discipline, so that they were, in a sense, trained to act like automatons and to go onto the field of battle and do what they were told. With a combination of punishment and of terror and of threats if they deserted, uh, these people once caught, in a sense, became what you might call His Majesty's slaves. And these were the very same people who, under better circumstances, would simply have emigrated to America to escape all this. <laughs> 
Only a generation before, redcoats and colonists had fought together in the French and Indian War. Together, they drove the French from North America, but at a crippling cost to the British. England was in debt, and for the first time, American colonists were expected to help pay Britain's bills. This is a nation that has been racked by a seven-year international war for empire with France and Spain. They've emerged the winners. They have an enormous war debt. They have to keep their army and navy mobilized because France is far from defeated. They're desperate for money. The English people have been taxed until they can be taxed no more. The English people themselves had no quarrel with the Americans because they were, as it, as it were, flesh of the flesh and blood of the blood of the Americans. They were the same people who on one side of the ocean were doing the work in England on the farms, on the other side of the ocean was settling America. On arriving in the New World, colonists had discovered two astonishing truths. First, land on this vast continent was available to nearly everyone. In England, only one out of 10 people owned property. In New England, nine out of 10 did. Second, one didn't have to be born wealthy to acquire wealth. Land and opportunity were the true wonders of the new world. But trouble began in 1763, when Parliament barred colonists from further settling of the frontier. Overnight, Americans were denied the land on which their American dreams were to be built. Many settlers ignored this proclamation, but they could not ignore another, the Stamp Act of 1765. Every piece of paper, from pamphlets to playing cards, suddenly required a revenue stamp. This was a tax, plain and simple, and the Americans had never been taxed before. Colonists from New Hampshire to Georgia boycotted British goods. Riots broke out. The die is now cast. The colonies must either submit or triumph. I trust they will come to submit. King George III. But it was Parliament who submitted under the pressure of riots and boycotts. Less than a year after it was imposed, the Stamp Act was repealed. Still, the mother country failed to understand why her offspring resisted being governed. There was a very famous English statesman by the name of Edmund Burke and he understood the Americans very well. He pleaded with Parliament to understand what it was the Americans wanted and to come to terms with them. He says, do you understand who they are? He says, these people, they are bold and fearless. And one thing which they have, which may be perhaps unlike other third world peoples, they have been raised in a tradition of English independence and of English autonomy. He said, they snuff the approach of tyranny in every painting. In every tainted breeze that comes, they snuff the approach of tyranny. As the British persisted in imposing new duties, tensions mounted. On March 5th, 1770, a mob of Boston dock workers ran up against a detachment of nine British soldiers. The crowd, brandishing planks and clubs, began to taunt the redcoats calling them scoundrel, lobster, sons of bitches. When hurling insults failed to incite the redcoats, the mob started to throw ice and rocks. Then, from somewhere in the crowd, someone yelled out, fire. Five Americans fell. A rebel agitator saw opportunity in this tragedy. He named it for history, the Boston Massacre. 
At nearly 50, Samuel Adams had failed as a brewer, businessman, and even tax collector. Now he found his true calling as a propagandist. This is a brilliant strategist for public protest. He used to advise people to go up to the soldiers' bayonets and let them prick them on the shoulder and then shout the equivalent of police brutality, police brutality. So he's just a genius, and he really found his calling. I think what makes him most interesting is among all the revolutionaries, I think this is a man who genuinely had confidence in the ability of ordinary people to make political decisions about their own life. To appease Boston, London repealed every tariff except one. Parliament would not part with the only lucrative duty, the tax on tea. England argued that it was merely an importer's fee. The rebels insisted a tax was still a tax, no matter what it was called. They refused to see England's tea landed on New England shores. On the night of December 16, 1773, 150 rebels darkened their faces with coal dust, wrapped themselves in blankets, and marched to the harbor, disguised as Mohawk Indians to hide their identities. In full view of a large crowd, as well as ships of the Royal Navy, they dumped 342 chests of tea to brew in Boston Harbor. For the British, the Boston Tea Party was really the last straw. It indicated what most British politicians had felt for years, that Boston in particular and Massachusetts in general were the center of colonial disaffection. It convinced the British that firm action had to be taken against Boston and Massachusetts if British authority was to be restored. The British closed the port of Boston, cleared judges from their benches, and replaced them with crown appointees. The punishment of Massachusetts alarmed all the colonies. Addressing the Virginia Convention, a shrewd, flamboyant lawyer rose to his feet and spoke treason. The war is actually begun. Why stand we here idle? Is life so dear, or peace so sweet, as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry. One month later, eight men lay dead on Lexington Green. When news of the bloodshed reached a 34-year-old militia captain named Benedict Arnold, he closed his shop in New Haven, Connecticut, and headed to the rebel camp at Cambridge. Benedict Arnold, as a civilian, had followed a number of different occupations, and that kind of is reflective of the fact that the man was probably a driven type A personality who just couldn't sit still. So he was uh, at one point an apothecary, at another point he was a ship captain, another point he was a merchant. A uh, very busy guy, very high energy levels. Outside Boston, Arnold found the newborn American army laying siege with no siege weapons. He knew that on Lake Champlain, on the New York frontier, the British had more than a hundred cannons at a fortress called Ticonderoga. Arnold set off to recruit men to attack it. He soon learned that others were already on their way. The brawling woodsmen who called themselves the Green Mountain Boys, led by a rum-swilling giant of a man named Ethan Allen. Allen and Arnold agreed to attack Ticonderoga together. 
At dawn on May 10th, 83 Americans crept toward the fort. They found the gate open. Only one sentry was on duty, and he was asleep. When he awoke, his musket wouldn't fire, and he ran away. Outside the officers' quarters, Ethan Allen yelled, Come out, you old rat! In 10 minutes, without a shot fired, Allen demanded surrender of the greatest fortress in America from a half-dressed British officer still holding his trousers. The British, I think, above all, felt humiliated by the loss of Ticonderoga. They had taken uh, this great fortress from the French at enormous cost in the Seven Years' War. And here, in 1775, there was a band of what one British officer called ragamuffins seizing this strategic post uh, from its British garrison did come as a considerable blow to British pride. Eight days after the capture of Ticonderoga, news of the victory reached the rebel leaders in Philadelphia. But the Continental Congress was more alarmed than elated by this overt act of aggression. It immediately ordered all the captured guns inventoried for return to the British as soon as hostilities had cooled down. Despite the bloodshed at Lexington and Concord, the men in Congress, like most colonists, hesitated to go to war against England. They still hoped for reconciliation. Tears stand in my eyes when I think of this once happy land of liberty. All is anarchy and confusion. We are all in arms. May God put a speedy and happy end to this contest between the mother and her children. Our situation here is beyond description almost. We are every hour expecting an attack by land or water. Fire and slaughter are hourly threatened. Boston loyalist Peter Oliver. Two days after Lexington, 20,000 rebels surrounded Boston. Trapped in the city with the Redcoats were thousands of Americans still loyal to the King of England. The British Commander-in-Chief, General Gage, had asked London for 20,000 more troops to suppress the insurrection. London granted 2,000, and three generals, Henry Clinton, William Howe, and John Burgoyne. The rebel press noted that the ship carrying the generals to the colonies was called the Cerberus, after the mythical three-headed dog that guarded the gates of hell. The British generals planned to attack the Americans and break the deadlock at Boston. But within 24 hours, rebel spies reported the British strategy to the Americans. The Americans decided to move first and occupy the Charlestown Peninsula. Their plan was to build fortifications above Boston Harbor, the lifeline for British supplies. The place they chose was called Bunker Hill. The man they chose to lead them was Massachusetts Colonel William Prescott. On the evening of June 16th, Prescott and more than a thousand men moved out to fortify Bunker Hill. Instead, in the confusion of darkness, the rebels chose a lower site called Breed's Hill. The Americans labored all night on their defenses. At first light, a watchman aboard a British warship 
was shocked to discover that the face of Breed's Hill was crowned by a 136-foot-long entrenchment. General Clinton proposed landing two forces on the Charlestown Peninsula and trapping the Americans between them. Surprisingly, General Gage overruled him and prepared for a more perilous move, a frontal assault. The decision of the British to actually storm the American defenses on Bunker's Hill, or Breed's Hill, as it was, may seem now rather odd, but the reason they did it, I think, was primarily psychological. The British had suffered an embarrassing, humiliating uh, reverse uh, on the day of Lexington and Concord. So they had to reassert the superiority of regular troops over the colonial militia. Gage's strategy required waiting six hours for high tide, six more hours for the Americans to fortify Breed's Hill. In Boston, General Gage stared through a spyglass at the hill and asked his aide the identity of the tall man standing on the earthworks, braving the cannonade from British warships. The aide said it was his own brother-in-law, William Prescott. When Gage asked, will he fight? The aide replied, I cannot answer for his men, but Prescott will fight you to the gates of hell. At the rebel redoubt, an elegantly dressed patriot arrived, carrying a borrowed musket on his arm and a book of poetry in his pocket. Joseph Warren was one of the colony's most successful physicians and the leader of the Boston rebels. At dinner the evening before, he had confided to companions that he had foreseen his death on this hill, but he had no intention of ducking the fray. These fellows say we won't fight. By heaven, I hope I shall die up to my knees in British blood. By 2 o'clock, the British had landed 2,500 troops. By 3 o'clock, they were ready. Along with much of Boston, General Burgoyne watched the assault on Breed's Hill. Now ensued one of the greatest scenes of war that can be conceived. Howe's troops ascending the hill. The roar of cannon, mortars, and musketry made the whole a picture of horror beyond anything that ever came to my lot to be witness to. The Redcoat charge collapsed. Officers, in particular, were singled out. They have appalling officer casualties, stuff that scares the dickens out of the British command structure because they have not experienced death rates and wound, serious wound rates among the officer corps like that in a comparable engagement in their living memory. Bringing up reinforcements, Howe ordered a second attack. And then a third. By now, the rebels were nearly out of powder. In the last charge, some had even fired broken glass, rocks, and nails in place of musket balls. Prescott's men waited until the Redcoats were again in range and spent their last precious rounds. Major Pitcairn, who had led the Redcoats onto Lexington Green just two months earlier, went down with four shots in him and died in the arms of his son. Defenseless now against British bayonets, Prescott finally ordered his men to retreat. The dead and wounded lay on every side of us, 
Their groans were piercing. Our orders were to make the best retreat we could. We set off almost gone with fatigue, leaving some of our dead in the field. Among those left in the field was the Patriot leader who had foreseen his own death, Joseph Warren. A British officer on burial detail wrote, Dr. Warren I found among the slain and stuffed the scoundrel with another rebel into one hole. And there he and his seditious principles may remain. Buying time for his comrades to retreat, Joseph Warren had been shot in the back of the head. He was 34 years old. I have just heard that our dear friend, Dr. Warren, fell gloriously fighting for his country. Great is our loss. Almighty God, cover the heads of our countrymen. May we be supported and sustained in the dreadful conflict. I cannot compose myself to write any further. Abigail Adams. By day's end, the British had won the field, but at a terrible price. Their casualty rate, over 40%, was the highest the British would suffer in the entire revolution. A thousand men were killed or wounded. General Clinton said it was a dear-bought victory. Another such would have ruined us. The Americans lost the hill, but they won a newfound confidence. What they lacked was training, a treasury, and a leader. In May of 1775, as American militiamen surrounded Boston, the Continental Congress gathered in Philadelphia. The 45 delegates were greeted with parades and musket salutes. But to the British Crown, the distinguished members of the Rebel Congress were outlaws. Every one of them could be hanged for treason. John Hancock, the wealthiest man in New England, had personally bankrolled the rebellion. Pennsylvania's most celebrated citizen, Benjamin Franklin, had just returned from rallying support in Europe for America's rebels. The radical orator Patrick Henry had been declared an outlaw by the governor of Virginia and could not set foot in his home colony. Finally, there was the always seditious Samuel Adams, the most vocal advocate of independence from the British Empire. While still hoping to restore peace, Congress prepared for war. It proclaimed the jumble of militia companies besieging Boston, the American Continental Army. Paying for the army was another matter. Congress had no power to levy taxes, so it simply invented a currency and issued two million new notes called Continental Dollars. They were designed and engraved by silversmith Paul Revere. Congress also had to choose a man to lead the new army. The commander of the militia, Artemis Ward, had never led troops in battle and was thought too timid. At 57, the veteran Connecticut colonel, Israel Putnam, was thought too old. The most experienced officer, a former English colonel named Charles Lee, was just too British. Samuel Adams' influential cousin John wanted a man from the South, someone who could bring the other colonies into New England's war. What they all wanted was a man they could trust with the terrible power of an army. 
On June 14th, Adams began to glowingly describe his candidate. A gentleman from Virginia who is among us here and very well known to all of us. A gentleman with skill and experience as an officer, independent fortune, great talents, and excellent universal character. Colonel George Washington of Virginia had arrived each day at Congress conspicuously clad in the red and blue uniform he had worn in the French and Indian War. At the end of that war, Washington had campaigned for an officer's commission in the British Army. The British turned him down. Now, Washington was campaigning once again. George Washington was a very unlikely choice. There weren't a lot of other choices. The Americans didn't have a very strong military tradition separate from the British. You know, it was a society that was a part of the British Empire. I think uh, George Washington maybe wasn't the greatest military figure in the world or the greatest man for the job at the time, but I think the greatness of the man was his ability to sort of promote himself as the best man for the job at a time when they needed somebody to do that. They were all um, brand new to the game. They didn't know where they were going. He had the great moxie you know, to show up at the Continental Congress and be his own PR. He said, I'm here, I can do the job. Congress voted unanimously to name Washington Commander-in-Chief. The 43-year-old Virginian had commanded troops in only two battles. One of them started the French and Indian War. The other, he lost. Looking back at it a couple centuries later, it was a great choice, but uh, at the time, I mean, it was a crapshoot. When Washington left Philadelphia to join his army, he wrote a soldier's farewell to his wife, Martha. I go fully trusting in that providence which has been more bountiful to me than I deserve. I retain an unalterable affection for you, which neither time nor distance can change. He assured her he'd return by Christmas, and he would, eight years later. Washington would be facing the finest army in the world. The British regulars had served an average 10 years, while the American militia was mostly untrained. But a New York newspaper noted a rebel advantage. It must be considered that there is a very material difference between a man who fights for his natural liberty and the man who only fights because he is paid. The British did possess a thousand times the wealth of the colonists who could barely manufacture weapons or gunpowder. The American Navy consisted of eight small vessels against 270 British warships. The world would be watching to see if the insolent Yankees could vanquish the professional Redcoats, to see if the American David could stand against the British Goliath. <laughs> 